I'm going to talk to an immigration law- lawyer, have that, have him on the line. Harjap Bangle. Ha- hi, Harjap. Hi there. Hi. I'll get your reaction in terms of um, to the government plans and the law, because we were just hearing um, that thought there from Sonia Skeets. I've also got Alp Mehmet, who's the chair of Migration Watch UK. Alp, Hello. 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 Um, I think it's really worth you kind of putting into context what, what you know, impact do migrants have on the UK? Let's forget about the small boats and everything for the moment, but migrants, how do they affect positively and negatively the UK? Well, um, let's not forget that in the last year, in 2022, there was a net migration of over 504,000 over half a million people. So immigrants like me, like Harja, uh, dare I say, um, not you, Naga. My parents, both of my parents. Your parents. Both of my parents. Um, Yeah, absolutely. And no one has ever suggested, to my knowledge, certainly not from Migration Watch, and I've been involved for 14 years, 15 years, that immigration should stop. That is not what people crossing the channel illegally is all about. That is something totally different. Okay, so if what we, look we at need the numbers, is good okay. immigration. Okay, but if so, if we look at the numbers, what was the number you said? Five hundred and uh, over five hundred thousand net okay. last year. Right. Yeah. Is there a target at the moment that the government has that says this number of legal migrants? is good for this country? No, I I think that um, what you need to look at is the sort of research that has been done in the past, which has consistently shown that overall, uh, all migration turns out to be a net fiscal cost. But that that is really something, it's a a separate issue. Um, And we're not talking about people who come here uh, to provide the skills, to um, join families, to study here and um, contribute to our society. That is not what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. What, When you're saying half a million people net coming here, over 1.3 million visas for long-term stay were issued at the same time last year, that is – you have to take into account – what that means for population growth, what that means for additional demands on services, on schools, and the rest of it. Houses, you know, how many people do um, the 8 million people who were added to our population in the 20 years between the two censuses, 20, 20 years, 8 million people, largely, if not entirely, the result of migration and children born to to new arrivals. That's the sort of thing that when you're talking about legal migration, you've got to take into account. At the moment, there is no limit. So is it wrong for the government to want to um, come down quite hard, come down hard on illegal immigration? No, uh, it, it, it's, the, it's the only thing to do, frankly. What, what has to happen is that we've got to send the message out that if you make, make, your way your, make your way here illegally, that you are not going to be able to stay. So far, last year there were 45,000. Uh, incidentally, there were 70,000 applications for asylum, so uh, clearly 30,000 found their way here um, without uh, having to jump into boats. But encouraging that, which is effectively what happens a lot of the time, for people to jump into boats, risk their lives, come here illegally, ahead of people who are uh, waiting in line and waiting patiently to come here, that is wrong. And most people, I think, in this country would say it's wrong. And 70,000, uh, sorry, 70% of those coming, bear in mind, are young men. Nearly 100% of them have destroyed their documents, don't have any passport when they arrive here. Uh, we don't know who they are. We have to take their word for it. 
Okay. That, again, is dangerous. It's wrong. Okay. With that, thank you for painting. Thank you for explaining kind of the landscape at the moment. Harjab um, Bangle, immigration lawyer. What is your reaction to the government's um, potential announcement tomorrow? Well, it seems they're saying what the public want to hear, but whether they're going to be able to practically get this off the ground, that's another thing. I mean, to send people back, you need to have the country who you're sending them to be willing to accept them. We don't have the return agreements in place. We have return agreements, I believe, between about with about six to ten countries, and they've got to agree to take our asylum seekers or our failed asylum seekers in. Now, Rwanda, one of the countries mentioned, only has 200 places. We've spent millions on that. And in a leaked document yesterday uh, from the Home Office, they themselves admit that the first flight, despite winning their case, they won't be able to get off the ground by until March 2024, the earliest. So if we look at the practicalities of this, um, denying someone asylum outright I think it's not going to be compatible with the convention and there will be legal challenges to it. So what's... However, I think the, the, the key here is about the removals, about the failure of the, this government to return people. Previous governments in before 2010 were sending up to 60,000 people a year back. But this current government is in, is in thousands. It's, it's way, way less than uh, what it has been. It's been slowly dwindling down. 50,000 people coming over on a small boat is not a problem if you're sending 60,000 people back. But if you're only going to send 2,000 people back out of the 50,000, then that does become a problem. So what's the answer? The answer is to catch the people who are sending these people over. P people smuggling makes more money than drug smuggling. So this is a, what the government is akin to saying is that if we lock up all of the drug users, drug dealing will stop. That is not going to work. What's going to work is to catch the people smugglers. Now, the people smugglers have been operating for 20 years, and Alp will probably agree with this, from the same routes. They come from Calais and they end up on the Kent coast. We know this because we see it on a daily basis. Everybody knows it, journalists, the public, lawyers. And yet we're unable to catch these gangs. So what we effectively we're admitting, or this government's admitting, is we've given up on catching the gangs. We can't catch these people, so we're going to do the next best thing and put deterrent policies in place, which we know don't work. So far, the Rwanda plan as a deterrent isn't working and hasn't worked. So what's gonna, what needs to happen is these gangs need to be caught. Now, I, I'm at sort of odds to believe that we can go and get Osama bin Laden holed up in somewhere unknown, and we can get Saddam Hussein from his stronghold fortress and put him on trial and yet we can't catch gangs which are operating from the same place the same route and are trafficking people to the uk for money and making money on this that's just beyond belief despite having mi5 the sas and all that elite forces right. and the border force and the navy why isn't anything done to stop these gangs and why hasn't there been anything done or are they just too clever for the government and now the government thinks you know what we're just going to try and get the end user as opposed to the person who's making money and, and supplying the product i should say um in a recent interview uh, a <laughs> uh, recent piece with the mail on sunday rishi sunak the prime minister says illegal migration is not fair on british taxpayers it's not fair on those who've come here illegally it's not right that criminal gangs should be allowed to continue their immoral trade i am determined to deliver on my promise to stop the boat. Stay with me, both of you, please. Our reporter, Simon Jones, is in Dover for us. Simon, um, morning to you. We've been looking at the scale of the problem um, and the situation at the moment in terms of crossings, in terms of why the government is going down this route, potentially. Well, you can see it up here from the White Cliffs of Dover, where I am. This morning, there have been two boats of migrants brought to shore. Just in the last hour, I've seen a border force vessel come in, bringing around 40 people. In the early hours of the lifeboat from Dover brought in 44 people who were picked up in the channel. It's getting a bit windy out there in the channel, so the conditions not ideal for these types of crossings. And of course, the people are coming across the world's busiest shipping lane. Now, today's arrivals takes this year's total to more than 3,000 people having made the crossing. That's almost double the figure we saw for the first couple of months of last year. Of course, last year we saw 
45,000 people make the journey. And I'm told behind the scenes, the Home Office are preparing for potentially up to 80,000 people to make the crossing during the course of this year. And that's why the government says it needs to be tough. It needs to take action. Rishi Sunak saying at the weekend, make no mistake, if you come here illegally, you won't be allowed to stay. Mm. OK. Um, what, has the, what tools has the government got at this moment in time? And how effective or ineffective are they? Well, I think what is quite telling is that last year we had the Nationality and Borders Bill, which was announced with a fanfare. The government said, surprise, surprise, that was going to stop the crossings and stop people risking their lives in the channel. Now, that created a new offence of illegally arriving in the UK. But clearly, the Home Secretary at the moment, Suella Braverman, and the Prime Minister think that doesn't go far enough. And that's why we're seeing new legislation that's to be outlined tomorrow. And the new mantra seems to be detain, deny and deport. So detain people who arrive, perhaps put them in immigration removal centres, deny them the right to claim asylum in the UK at all and deport them to Rwanda or another safe country. So it's going further than what we have at the moment. And this particular idea that if someone arrives by boat, then they'll be barred from ever coming back to the UK. But obviously charities are questioning whether this is humane and whether actually it's workable and legally sound. Well, and let's, let's, rem let's not forget there are other legal challenges to other um, proposals such as flights to Ru Rwanda ongoing. I think that's, that's the big problem for the government because it's all very well saying let's deport people and we've got strong newspaper headlines today that will no doubt play well with conservative voters but the reality is at the moment it's already well saying we'll deport people to rwanda but since that scheme was announced not a single person has been sent to rwanda because it's been marred in legal challenges those challenges are still ongoing even though the government had a victory in the case that it was deemed legal to send people to rwanda but there are still challenges to that and in terms of deporting people to other safe countries, for example, France that people have passed through before getting on these boats over to Kent. Well, there's no returns agreement with France. There's no returns agreement with any country in the EU. So that is going to be a huge challenge. And just to look at the figures, in between January 21 and September 2022, some 20,000 people were told that the government was minded not to consider their asylum claims because they, they were deemed inadmissible because they'd passed through a safe country before getting here or people had already claimed asylum in another country. Out of those 20,000 so far, only 21 have suffered an enforced removal, have been subjected to an enforced removal on inadmissibility grounds. So that just gives you a scale. It's very easy to talk about removing people, far harder to do it in reality. I mean, Suella Braverman, the Home Secretary, has um, said that people are sick of hearing talk and no action. I mean, OK, fair enough. Uh, there will be people who are sick of hearing talk and no action. But the fact is... is <laughs> I mean, you've alluded to it with the um, legal challenges. The action seems impossible to kind of get underway. Well, I think everyone, the government included, realises this is going to be a massive challenge. And the Home Secretary has always said this isn't a problem that can be fixed overnight. These are certainly radical ideas and they're certainly going to be challenged. But if you look at, for example, what the Refugee Council are saying, they're saying that these proposals from the government will see tens of thousands of people locked up at, in detention at a huge cost, people treated as criminals simply for seeking refuge. They reckon that if 65,000 people arrive so far this year, if 65,000 arrive this year, a projected figure that could cost about one and a half billion pounds if people are kept in detention for an average of around six months. So huge financial challenges to this, huge legal challenges, no doubt, are likely to be put against these ideas. But the government is saying they simply have to do something radical. As you say, Suella Brabham saying at the weekend, people have had enough of the tough talking, not followed by action. And she says she's going to sort this problem out once and for all. I think it's certainly a bold challenge. Mm, it is. Simon, thank you so much. Um, let's return to um, Harjat Bangal, who's an immigration lawyer, and Alp Mehmet, who is the chair of Migration Watch UK. Alp, I, I, I just wonder if this all... I don't think there's a, there, there can 
be any dispute that this illegal migration needs to be challenged. I think what it is, is the government, for all its tough talk, has a very, very long road ahead and uh, it's not something that's going to happen quickly, as Simon said. Uh, uh, absolutely, and, and so much of what Simon said, I, I echo. Uh, certainly, uh, the, the risk for the government is that this time next year we'll be saying exactly the same things and we'll be having exactly the same debate. If that happens, I think they can kiss goodbye to many people voting for, her, for them in the next general election. But uh, j just to pick up on something that Harjap said earlier, um, that this is all going to be solved by removing people, which I agree needs to, to happen. But I would also point to why people are not being removed and uh, his profession uh, playing a, a part in that. OK. I, I'm, I'm afraid that there will be challenges. Of course, there will be challenges. And, and a lot of it will depend on what sort of will and what sort of determination um, the government has in getting through the the right legislation this time. And let, let's not forget that government is supreme, that, sorry, parliament is supreme, that we can, in fact, pass any laws to ra override any other laws. International laws and our commitment and signing up to uh, various treaties is a different matter. But the fact is that we can legislate. And if part of the legislation says that the Home Secretary must detain and remove people arriving quickly, then that, that will be our law and that they will find, have to find a way to do that. France is a safe country. It isn't a war-torn country. And I'm afraid that uh, in the end, we probably will have to um, have some sort of deal with the French. But it's no good thinking that we can tackle smugglers and traffickers just in France, and that will do it. What about those operating in Libya or those operating in Afghanistan or those operating in, in Turkey and many other countries across Europe? What you haven't got is one Mr. Big, a big gang that you can go after and take them down. That is not going to happen, I'm afraid. Uh, Harjit. Yeah, well, I, I sort of disagree with out there. It's not lawyers, I would say, who are uh, a problem in relation to that. They, and no, is it the Human Rights Act that seems to get um, criticised a lot? The Human Rights Act has been around since 2002, and lawyers have been around for much longer. If lawyers and the Human uh, Rights Act were the obstacle, then in 2009 we wouldn't be sending back 50,000, 60,000 people. And surely that would have taken effect after 2002. The fact is that you've got to get the gangs. The problem we're talking about is the small boats. The small boats are primarily coming from France, and these gangs do operate from there. So once you get the gangs, that will be a big, big number in uh, the supply definitely coming why, why down. Why are the French and doing it, Harjap? Why aren't the French doing that? It's it's their country, it's their territory. Why why does that have to be something that we've got to tackle by having because groups it's, because that it's I'm our, sure our, already exist? Because it's our border we want to secure. Why should the French um, take on our burden for that? So we're going, sure, to send sure. the SA, we're going to send the SAS to France? Oh, See, this is an example. This is, That's just this, a nonsense. Gentlemen, well, this is an example of how this conversation does, does end up at the moment and people just trying to figure out the situation and what the answers are and um, the government being in exactly that same conversation uh, position. Um, we hey, await absolutely. this announcement tomorrow. Uh, we could continue, but I am out of time. But I do really appreciate both of your views. Alp Mehmet, who is the chair of Migration thank Watch UK, you. and Harjit well, Bangal, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank immigration. You. And thank you for the debate as well, because it just shows that there are no, there's absolutely no easy solution here, um, as the frustration with the government and voters has been seen.